Good evening. I would like to call the regular meeting of the Planning Commission to order at 6 p.m. I would like to call upon Commissioner Cabral, or Vice Chair Cabral, I'm sorry, to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Chair. Planning Secretary, may you please call roll? Definitely, Chair. Commissioner Ayala? Here. Commissioner Hernandez is absent. Commissioner Round? Here. Vice Chair Carvajal? Here. Chair Jimenez? Here. We have a quorum? Thank you. Ex parte communications. This section is intended to allow all officials the opportunity to reveal any disclosure regarding site visits or ex parte communications about public hearings. Commissioner Carbajal, none. Commissioner Rounds, none. Commissioner Yala, none. And I have none. Thank you. Public comments. Public comments are now open. Anyone joining us? Through Zoom, can use the raise hand function if you wish to make a public comment on any item on the agenda or not on the agenda, except for comments for public comment. The planning secretary will see if you have a, raised your hand through the Zoom application. Please note that you will have three minutes to speak. Planning secretary, do we have any members in the public wishing to speak? No, we do not. Great, thank you. I will now close public comment and move on to the next item. Item number six, approval of minutes. Can I get a motion and a second for approval of minutes, please? I'll move. Commissioner Carbajal, second. Moved by Commissioner Round, second by Vice Chair Carbajal. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? So ordered. Planning commissioners, we are now going to hear new business item number 10 and 11 prior to public hearing items. Item number 10, new business, parkway tree removal appeal decision, resident request for removal of parkway tree 9837 Bartley Avenue. At the request of the homeowner, the appeal is being removed from the agenda and will not be heard for further planning commission action. Item number three, parkway tree removal, appeal decision, resident request for removal of park, parkway tree 11323. I would like to call upon Director of Public Works, Noe Negrete, to please present item number 11. Patrick, my apologies. We're removing Fredson, but here in Bartley. Okay. My apologies. No problem. So first, let's go over the uh, history or the sequence of how we got here. The uh, original request uh, for the parkway tree removal uh, was received by the city on August 3rd, 2022. Uh, the primary reason uh, for, the, for the resident's removal request is that it's causing damage to the side map. On September 12th, uh, staff reviewed and evaluated the request and denied that request and sent that communication uh, back to the resident. On September 22nd, uh, the residents submitted their tree removal appeal form and added uh, damage to the fence uh, from the tree roots as an additional reason for requesting the tree to be removed. And we're here, you, here uh, before you today on October 10th to hear the appeal uh, from the, for the uh, removal of that tree. The tree in question is a holly oak tree, uh, and that is also uh, a tree that is designated on the master plan. That's just a, it's a holly. So before we get into specifics on that tree, uh, let's talk about the criteria that's needed for removal of a tree uh, in the parkway. Uh, so it has to meet one of these criteria. It can meet more, uh, but at least one in that. So it has to be either dead, 
dying, diseased, insect infested, uh, dangerous, which we'll get into the uh, definition of the rules of life, damage beyond restoration, damaging certain structures, which I'll also define, and then also non conforming to the existing uh, tree master plan. <coughs> So dangerous, uh, there's a few uh, definitions of what dangerous means as far as uh, for trees. So it has to be a tree who's growing in the power lines uh, where they cannot be reasonably trimmed and they're deemed an immediate hazard. A tree that is either leaning uh, to the point of being unstable in heavy winds, or a tree that has experienced extensive root pruning making it a hazard, or a tree that's blocking any kind of traffic, uh, traffic control device. And that cannot be uh, remedied by simply trimming the tree, or a tree that presents hazard to the general public or causes a liability to the city. All those would fall under the dangerous uh, category. As far as damaging certain structures, uh, there's two criteria. Uh, one was uh, a recent uh, that the homeowner stated in the request was for the damage to the sidewalk, uh, but it also could be damage to your curb, your driveway. A building or other structures. In this case, uh, they also mentioned that their uh, their own personal fence uh, was being damaged from the roots as well. Um, however, the cost to repair the damage uh, has to exceed the value of the tree. So in this case, the repair of the sidewalk um, has to be less than the value of the tree. If that's the case, then we would we would do the lesser of the two, right? We would just replace the sidewalk as opposed to removing the tree. Uh, the other uh, damaging certain structure doesn't apply in this case, uh, but I'll read it anyways. It's where the sewer or underground utilities are causing damage. Uh, in that case, uh, some uh, proof need to be, needs to be provided by the residents, but in this case, uh, that was not uh, an issue brought up by the residents. So here's a few pictures uh, of that property on 9837 Bartley. As you can see here, uh, there is a sidewalk offset uh, from the curb. There's a parkway area and the tree in question. Uh, you see it there. It's a multi trunk uh, tree. There's a little bit of uplift, which will show in a different picture. Uh, but the sidewalk, at least uh, in this picture, uh, seems to be uh, safe. There's no uplift. But we didn't really see any damage to the uh, fence as well that was claimed. At least from the street side, we couldn't see any. Uh, we didn't see any uh, roots uplifting in the parkway as well. Uh, we didn't see any damage to the to the curb as well. But we did see damage to the sidewalk. So you can see there, kind of at a point. And if you zoomed in a little bit further, it's got the pointer. Yeah. You can see there, there's a gap in the sidewalk as it's uplifted. Uh, this is still less than a half inch, so we can still grind that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not deemed a tripping hazard unless it's over a half inch. Uh, so we can schedule that to be uh, grinded. We can go back and infill some of this area here, but there is a root, as you can see right there. Um, our, our solution would be the grinding initially, uh, place it on a list uh, to get it uh, replaced uh, when we do sign up the place. That's a, a further way you can see there's no lean. Uh, perfect canopy. Uh, it was recently trimmed uh, back in August uh, this year. And uh, since 2012, the tree has been trimmed on a two year cycle. Our normal cycle is every three years. Uh, so this has actually gotten uh, more attention than our normal uh, three year cycle. And let's go back to the criteria that was mentioned again. Uh, so after evaluation by staff, uh, the tree was not dead, uh, it's not dying. It's not diseased or in, uh, insect infested. It's not dangerous, uh, not damaged beyond restoration. There's no damaging certain structures and it does conform uh, to the master tree plan since it is a hollow oak tree. And just going into the other two that are more in depth uh, for dangerous, uh, there was no power lines uh, as a hazard. The tree was not leaning. Uh, there was not uh, extensive root pruning. Uh, it was not blocking the traffic control devices. And uh, it's not a general, it's not a hazard to the general public. And going back to the damaging certain structures, again, uh, we do acknowledge that there is damage to the sidewalk, but however, the cost to repair that sidewalk is far less than the value of that tree. 
Uh, so again, we're going to go grind it, and then we will put it on our list uh, to replace once we do sidewalk in that area. And the last one, the damage to sewer underground utilities does not apply uh, in this case. So we're here uh, before you uh, for the recommendation from the staff is to reaffirm uh, the decision of the public, right of public works to deny the request to have the city remove the tree. And also um, the planning commission has the authority to issue a permit uh, to the uh, homeowner property owner to uh, remove the tree on their, on their own, their own cost. Uh, so in this case, we also ask that we deny the property owner a permit to remove the tree, to remove the tree at their own cost. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so if you have any. Do you want to go I'm first? If I could be first, when was this photo taken of the house? Okay. Um, so I believe I need to recluse myself from uh, any discussion or about this tree. Um, and I mean, I'd be welcome to talk to the uh, to the city attorney why I'm going to do that. And I, you know, I don't want to influence anybody's decision. Can I come over and talk to you real quick? Perhaps the best if we can take a two minute break. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, can we please take a two minute break? At six eleven. Six eleven. Hello. Okay, the planning commission will resume at 618. Okay, uh, if I may, um, after discussion with the uh, council, I'm going to be abstaining from uh, any discussion or vote on this item, uh, only because um, I have personally talked to this resident in the last month or so, and uh, I don't feel that I would be comfortable voting one way or another on that. So I'll be abstaining okay, okay no problem any questions from the commissioners i have one um you said the last time this tree was pruned back was when now and then the, it can only be pruned back a certain um percentage correct if i'm understood before, rather than the tree go in shock do is our arborist here Mm -hmm. Yes, we typically uh, prune 25% of the capacity, so sometimes more than others, depending on the But uh, some trees are successful, they, you know, typically, uh, typically hope. Now, is this one of those trees, and uh, pardon me for not looking it up specifically, that is um, um, under state law like we've had some we have some trees where you cannot take them out correct this is not one of the not protected okay thank you any other questions um i have a question do you know when about will the sidewalk be fixed is it some time away i mean like you said it's going to be grinded for right now, correct? Not sure when it's going to get replaced. We try to get it kind of bundled. Okay. I would say based on what you saw, it's like having a lower priority. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. Um, yes. Do we know how long the, the, res the residents of that household have been there? Have been residing in that home? I don't. Okay, no other questions. Since this is an appeal, if the appellant is in the audience and would like to speak on their matter, please approach the podium at this time. Okay, having no further comments or questions, I would like to request a motion to take action on item number 11. Commissioner Carbajal to deny. Commissioner David to deny. Okay. Now for a roll call vote. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner. 
just to be clear, there's two denials. One is for the city to not remove it. And number two is to deny a permit for the resident to remove it. Okay. So you can just clarify the uh, motion. Yes. Yeah, so are we denying both or one? What was your motion for? My motion was for deny removal of the tree. Um, if I could say that if they want to pay for it, then they can do that. I motion that as well. If they want to pay for it themselves, then they can do it. Okay, so we're motioning just for the denial of the city removal of the tree. And if the applicant or the appellant decides to pay for themselves, then they they could do it. Could I get a roll call vote, please? Most definitely, Chair. Commissioner Ayala? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Rounds is recused. Vice Chair Carpajal? Aye. And Chair Jimenez? Aye. Passes 3 0. Okay, thank you. Item number seven public hearing. Adoption of mitigated negative declaration, development plan approval, DPA case number 933 1, conditional use permit, CUP case number 833, modification permit, MOD case number 1347. I would like to call upon assistant planner Jimmy Wong to please present item number seven. Hello, Commissioner. Um, Presenting uh, development plan approval, case number 933-1, conditional use permit, case number 833, and modification permit 1347. So the subject property has an address of 10051 Santa Fe Spring Row. Uh, general plan destination is industrial, and zoning is M2, heavy manufacturing. The applicant is DR. Applicant representative is DRA Architect, and the owner of the property is Omega OU2 LLC. Here's a um, photo of the subject property. It's located along Santa Fe Spring Row on the west side. Um, so the subject property can press up one parcel and measuring around 3.23 acre. So a little background on the property itself. Uh, back in September 10, 2018, it was approved with a tentative parcel map 78232 and original DPA 933. The original uh, parcel map allowed for the parcel to subdivide into five individual parcel. And this property is labeled as parcel four from the tenant parcel map. The original development plan approval allowed for the construction of a new 60,117 square foot concrete tilt up building. And the property itself was utilized as a oil extraction operation since 1920 and was owned by Brightburn Operating LP. Here's the three proposed uh, entitlement again. Uh, the first one is uh, development plan approval 933-1, a request for approval to amend the existing development plan approval to allow the construction of a 48,649 square foot industrial building and related improvement on the subject property. The second one is a conditional use permit, case number 833, a request for approval to establish, operate, and maintain a water pumping and treatment plan on the subject property. And the last entitlement is modification permit case number 1347, a request for approval to temporary reserve but not provide 70 required parking stall on the subject property. So that's the first entitlement, um, development plan approval. So as mentioned before, the original approval allowed for a 60,117 square foot building. Uh, the new proposed building will be 48,649 square foot, which is a reduction of 11,468 square foot. And also there will be a modification on the number of dock door and modification on the location 
of the building. Here's the site plan. Um, the one on the left is what's being proposed and the one on the right is what was previously approved. <coughs> so as uh, the previously approved building was set back 25 foot from Santa Fe Spring Row, the new proposed building will set back 60 foot from Santa Fe Spring Row. And that's an increase of 35 foot. Uh, the proposed building will utilize the same approved 40 foot wide driveway for ingress and egress on Santa Fe Spring Row. And there will also be two driveways circling blue that will allow the south and west pop along the south and west property line uh, that will allow for interior opening that will allow for travel between each parcel for fire, ingress and egress. There will be one 440 square foot trash enclosure located on along the northwest corner of the property. Here's the new proposed floor plan. Um, the area in red will be office area. Um, and the, the area in blue will be the mezzanine storage and the rest of the area will be equipment storage area. Here's the proposed elevation in the bottom and the previously approved elevation on top. So the previous, previously approved building was designed to have a maximum of 35 foot and six inch in height. The newly proposed building will only have a max, will have a maximum height of 40 foot and six inch. That's an increase of five foot. And however, the overall of the building will, will be a decrease in size. In addition, uh, the applicant has, um, retain the same similar design as the previously approved building, which will be consistent with the other building that was previously approved as part of the overall build, uh, development. There will be no dock door for a dock door for this project. Instead, there will be overall 10 loading door. And the applicant will also be constructing a 12 foot high block wall along Santa Fe Spring Road and plant tall tree for screening. So here, once again, here's the elevation of the proposed building. As you can see from the bottom left rendering, you can see the proposed block wall and the tree that will be planted along Santa Fe Spring Road and it will create a screen for the elevation. Here's the proposed landscaping plan. Uh, majority of the landscaping will be planted in the perimeter of the building and the parking area. So parking requirement based on the proposed building area, 78 parking stall is required and the applicant is proposing to only provide eight parking stall. In conjunction with the proposed development plan approval, the applicant is requesting a modification permit to allow for the reduction of parking. And I will go over the modification permit on the, on the next slide. So I mentioned previously that proposed development is required to provide 78 parking stall. And this is uh, a site plan or parking plan that show all 78 parking stall if they were to provide it as required by the zoning ordinance. However, the applicant is requesting to temporarily reserve but not provide 70 parking stall on the subject property for outdoor storage. And the area in blue is where they will be proposing the outdoor storage. So, so according to the applicant, the proposed water treatment plan will only have two employees at any given time. Since our zoning ordinance does not calculate parking based on the demand, but rather on the square footage of the building, According to the zoning ordinance, they will be required to provide 78 parking. However, the proposed eight parking stall will be more than enough for the building occupant and any visitor for the water treatment plan. So the last uh, entitlement is conditional use permit, case number 833. So according to section 155.243J, uh, section 27 of the zoning ordinance, 
a water pumping and treatment plant is required to obtain a conditional use permit uh, before operation. And this is the request from the applicant. So the proposed uh, water pumping and treatment project will be part of a groundwater contaminant project that is that will be implemented for the Omega Chemical Corporate Superfund site. So the proposed water pumping and treatment plan will house majority of the equipment and operate the following system. Um, the green sand filtration, advanced oxidation pro process, liquid phase garnet, active carbon absorption, and reverse osmosis system. So any discharge uh, un that come from this plant will be recycled and be uh, will be recycled offsite by a group vendor, and the US EPD will oversee the operation. So it should also be noted that uh, the proposed project will be subject to the US state code, section 121E1, which state no federal, state, or local permit should be required for the portion of any removal or medial action con conducted entirely on site. For environmental review, um, a ISMND, a mitigate negative declaration was repaired and circulated within the required 30 day public review period, started from July 19, 2022 through August 18, 2022. It was posted on the state clearinghouse and LA County recorder office. Um, during the review period, we received four common letter and a respond common letter was prepared and is part of the attachment eight from the staff report. Uh, public hearing notice was mailed on September 29, 2022, and also posted on City Hall, Town Center Hall, and the library, and also published on Whittier Daily News. Um, staff did receive one common letter today um, around 10 a.m. Uh, since it was last minute, we did not include it as part of the staff report. However, we did email that common letter to the city council as we receive it in the morning. So based on the common letter um, uh, staff received, it explained that there is a fair argument that the project is required environmental impact report and request the city to revise and recirculate the mitigated negative deck. Um, the response from the city staff is that the letter was received outside of the CEQA review period that was previously described in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. And also staff and city, our city environmental consultant do not believe a environmental impact report is required for the proposed development. So for the consideration on uh, the development plan approval. Uh, with the approval of the proposed modification permit, the project does meet all the criteria set for in section 155.139 of the zoning ordinance for granting of a development plan approval. Secondly, the project in involved the construction of a new and attractive individual building on site that is currently vacant. And lastly, the design of the new concrete tube building provide high quality architectural design as demonstrated by glazing, pop out, and variation in material and color. So for consideration on a conditional use permit, um, the proposed water pumping and treatment plan provide, uh, provide that a conditional permit is granted will be consistent with the current zoning and the land use designation. And the proposed water treatment facility will treat the groundwater by reducing contaminant to below discharge standard Therefore, the proposed water treatment facility will greatly improve the water quality within the immediate facility and will not be adversary effect to the city. Uh, consideration for the modification permit, according to the applicant, the groundwater treatment system will only require two employees per shift and the proposed eight parking stall uh, should be more than enough for the building occupant and visitor for the visitor of the, of the use. And the applicant has also provided alternative site plan 
to identify where the 70 additional parking stall can be located if, if that need is arise. So staff is recommending approving and adopting the proposed environmental document, uh, initial study mitigated negative deck, and the mitigated monitoring reporting program. And also approve uh, DPA 933-1, CUP 833, uh, MOD 1347, subject to the condition as stated within the attached resolution, and adopt resolution number 215-2022, which incorporate the planning commission finding and action regarding this matter. And that concludes my presentation. We do have the applicant and our environmental consultant to answer any question, and I'm here to answer any question regarding the project. So, Thank you, Jimmy. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? I don't have any questions now. I'd just like to reserve uh, anything for after the public hearing is closed. Okay. Okay, then I would like to open the public hearing at 6.38 p.m. I would like to call upon the applicants if they wish to speak. Please approach the podium. Use the raise hand function at this time. Okay, Jack, please state your name and city of residence for the record and address the planning commission. Oh, good evening. My name is Jack Keener. I'm the OU2 project coordinator who's overseeing the implementation of this project on behalf of my clients. And I make myself available answering questions you may have. Okay, great. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Jack? I do. Um, they say he, that they have an extra offsite for 70. If that's needed of the parking stalls, where would that be at? Uh, so, um, let me see. Let me. Sorry. Uh, hold on. I think this will make it. So, so right. Right here will be where the parking stall will be located and the landscaping area around here. So all together will be a 70 parking stall. Any other questions? Is there anyone from the audience wishing to speak on this matter? If so, please use the raise hand function and approach the podium. Sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Aaron Contreras. I'm a representative of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I live and work here in the vicinity of the project um, where the project will recreate. I believe that I will be impacted by the environmental impacts of the project. Uh, workforce requirements reduce construction-related environment impacts while benefiting the local economy and workforce development. Uh, we do believe the city should require the project to be built with contractors that hire locally, pay prevailing wage, and utilize apprentices from state-certified apprenticeship programs. The South Coast Air Quality Management District recently found that local hire requirements can result in air pollutant uh, reductions. Other cities have already uh, applied workforce requirements to private development projects in their city. Um, for example, the city of Hayward of Northern California adopted workforce requirements into this general plan in the, munis in the municipal code. Uh, we also believe the city should continue this term and review, revise, and recirculate the project's environmental docu documentation. The city only included the record only first four pages of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters August 16, 2022, 23-page comment, comment letter. Additionally, the city has failed to respond substantively to any of the concerns addressed on August 16. The comment letter, which raised concerns about potentially significant and unmitigated environment in, impacts and air quality, biological resources, energy use, and geology. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? Okay. Planning Commission Secretary, is there any comments submitted via email for this item? The only comment received was the one that Jimmy indicated that was forwarded to your email. Okay. Is there anyone who spoke against the project? If so, um, I would like to call upon the applicant for a rebuttal. Good evening. So my name is Jack Keener again. Um, I don't necessarily have a rebuttal. I think what's important to understand about this particular project is it's not a housing development. It's not a uh, warehouse where there's a large number of vehicular trips that will occur on a daily basis. We're building a groundwater pump and treat remedy to uh, hydraulically contain the upper two thirds of the Omega Chemical Superfund site operable unit number two. And so we're gonna pump that groundwater up. We're gonna clean it to um, very rigorous standards and we're gonna discharge the clean water out to the river basin for infiltration so that it will replenish the underlying aquifer. Uh, the, the concentrate stream or the brine stream will be discharged to sanitary sewer to go down to the joint reclamation plant for uh, effectively recycling down there under the hypox program so um and, and short of the uh interim construction impacts uh, our facility is going to have two people in it for the next hundred years as long as the, that facility is in operation um epa when they developed a proposed plan back in 2012 they did an extensive evaluation of the environmental impacts that could be posed by this particular remedy and variations of this remedy at much larger flow rates. And so um, I think that we're uniquely positioned as a, as a public benefit and our clients are engaged in this activity, not as a private venture, but in the public trust. Um, and so I think that's something that's important for people to understand. We're doing it to, to remediate uh, a regional groundwater plume of which my clients are only partially responsible for. There are other uh, entities that are not at the table today that are not doing their share and my clients are okay uh, commissioner i would like to clarify that um staff have received the common letter only from today um and other common letter regarding the CEQA report was uh received from uh from the gentleman that was speaking earlier in public review Okay. All right, then. Um, that being said, I would like to close the public hearing at 6.45 p.m. Do the commissioners have any comments regarding this matter? Well, I, I, yeah, I would like to make a comment. I know this has been going on for years and years and, you know, finally get to the point that we can remediate that problem that's been there for a long time. Um, I did open the email this morning that was received and it's very lengthy, very detailed and uh, a lot of things that I just totally don't understand. So um, I don't know if there's good, bad, or in between, uh, but I know in the past uh, when there's been a project like this, and even though a letter has been received after the comment period or out of the CEQA as was stated, it was still considered. So I think we should take that into consideration before we make a, a final decision. If I may, the letter, the 288 page, letter that was received, obviously the planning commission can, can make the decision, but it came in at the 11th hour. And if you were to read through a lot of it, it simply states why the union should be used. There is some mention of CEQA, but a lot of it is essentially why the applicant should use 
labor for the job. Um, my comments are basically the same as Commissioner Rounds, and I think it's something to be looked at um, for all aspects, and especially for union jobs in the city. Um, for myself, so I would like time to work on that and see what we can do. Um, though we know the applicant is willing to work, uh, we have people and residents in this city that are union and that live here and we support them. I also agree. I think it's important to note that the Planning Commission can only make a decision based on the evidence and we cannot force a developer to hire union workers. You have to make a decision based on the evidence presented and not just force a developer to use union workers. Okay, going forward, um, I think we need more time to look into this matter. It was a lengthy email and uh, I say we bring it back to the commission. Um, about 30 days next uh, commission meeting. Is that fine? Could I get a motion and a second, please, to bring it back? Motion. Well, I'm the, uh, this is Jack Keener again. Sorry for the interruption, if I may. Um, we're not. And uh, uh, we're not adverse to providing opportunities for union contractors and union shops to bid work. We're not even, we're not we're not anywhere near that at this point. We're trying to get to the place where we've got the permissions to move things forward relative to this program. I read the original letter that was provided by the law firm. I reread the letter that came today, and there's nothing about this project that is counter to the tenants of this project. There is no traffic impact. There is no biological, uh, cultural, or other impacts posed by the work we're preparing to do, the project itself. The ancillary obligation for uh, hiring union labor is secondary to this conversation. And we're, like I said, we're not adverse to offering up qualified firms an opportunity to bid the job. There'll be, we're not building a thousand stick homes. So I'm not exactly sure that the magnitude of contractor work that or carpenter work that's gonna be available. We're building a, a concrete tilt up building here. So um, this is all privately funded. It's overseen by the federal government, but it's a privately funded program. That's an obligation under a federal consent order. So put it to you this way, if my clients weren't obligated under federal law, to do this, they wouldn't. So this, we are not land developers who are trying to build a thousand residential units. We're not that, we're not that party. So I understand that there was a lot of things thrown at the planning commission. I think the planning staff has done a wonderful job in, in capturing that information and getting feedback from the, the CEQA consultant retained by the city to address actual or potential or perceived impacts posed by the project itself. There aren't any. That's reflected in our mitigated negative declaration. We'll have uh, tribal members on, on property during dirt, dirt disturbance. Um, we'll, you know, we have all the other plans in place to address potential impacts posed by the property itself, given its industrial use. But there are all the policies, plans, and procedures are already known. They're in place. We have 1166 requirements or EQMD. We have a soil management plan that's been vetted by the fire department. I would ask uh, the planning commission to, to vote on these matters so that we can continue our process moving forward. You know, you're, we wanna make sure that we're continuing on. And as one of the commissioner members said, this project has been in the works since 1995, if you really wanna get specific, back when the Omega Chemical Superfund site was first listed on the national priorities list. The proposed plan for operable unit two came out in 2012. It's taken us 10 years to get to where we are today. And, you know, all things being equal, we will probably be operating this remedy by 2025. So 
this is just a, a one piece of many pieces that are in play. And like I said, if union union shops want to bid the job, they can bid the job. They can reach out to me like every other construction service company that's been asking about work that's coming down the pipeline. So I'd ask I'd ask the council, the, the commission to, to vote on the matter if they, if they would. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I think we have a motion on the floor already. I did in second. Okay. We got one motion. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. And now could I get a roll call vote, please? Oh, excuse me. So a motion and a second to continue at the next uh, planning commission meeting next month. And Chair Jimenez, just to clarify, as um, uh, Wayne mentioned, here today we are here to vote on whether or not you guys are approving um, these the the DPA conditional use permit and the modifications. So um, the, the really what you're deciding is whether or not they met the criteria. If you want to go ahead and continue it before any specific reason, it should be as to whether or not it met the criteria or if you want additional information. So I just wanna make sure that we're clear on as to the reason that the continuance is being made. Okay, uh, could we say additional information then? Specifically, if you wanna go ahead and what specific information are we- Well, we had an email that was sent to us and we want time to look it over. If that's what the commission wishes, I just want to make sure that that it's clear that when it comes back before you um, in 30 days, that the decision really is to whether to approve it or deny it based on the criteria that yes. the code has, not it, based on what union labor um, required a letter is. But if you want time to review that, then we you can make that motion to continue it. Yes. So we we need the time to review that. And we do have a motion in a second for that. Can I get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Round? Aye. Vice Chair Carbajal? Aye. Chair Jimenez? Aye. It's continued 4 0 to November. I do apologize. I'll check the date again. <laughs> <laughs> the 14th, 2022. Thank you. Item number eight. CEQA exemption section 15332, class 32, tentative parcel map, number 83729, development plan approval, case number 993-995, conditional use permit, case number 828. I would like to call upon associate planner Vince Velasco to please present item number eight. Good evening, planning commissioners. Uh, excuse the wrong item number here. There was a shuffle in the items earlier today. Uh, but this item is to act upon tentative parcel map number 83729, development plan approval case numbers 993-995, and conditional use permit case number 828. The subject property is located on the southeast corner of Imperial Highway and Marquardt Avenue with a specific address of 13808 Imperial Highway. The general plan land use designation is industrial with a zoning of M1PD, light manufacturing plan development, and the applicant is PS Southern California One Incorporated or otherwise known as public storage. Um, some background on the subject site. It is approximately 3.46 acres in size currently developed with an existing 53,600 square foot multi-tenant industrial building, which was constructed in 1956. There is an existing 50 foot high wireless monopalm tower approved by CUP 642. And as additional background information, public storage purchased the property in December of 2021. The subject site is also located within the city's methane zone as it is, it is within a thousand feet of the former Norwalk dump landfill and as such applicable building code and fire code requirements will be required during plan check. 
uh, a little background on self-storage uses and facilities within the city of Santa Fe Springs. Uh, first to start, I would like to mention that self-storage and many warehouses uh, will be used interchangeably. Um, as the code mentions, many warehouse, but today's um, operations seem to call out self-storage as the type of use. Uh, back in 1974, before I was a twinkle in my parents' eye, uh, the city council adopted ordinance 461 um, to basically uh, re-examine these types of uses as they started to pop up throughout the city. So ordinance 461 was a temporary ordinance or otherwise a moratorium so that the city council could therefore adopt um, or, uh, standard property development standards and specific requirements for these types of uses. And as such a few months later in October of 1974, the city council adopted ordinance number 468, which uh, required a CUP for these types of uses within the M1 and M2 zones and established development standards for the self-storage uses, specifically uh, not to locate on major secondary arterials and not to locate on properties greater than two acres in size. And then many years later in, uh, in September of 2017, the city council adopted ordinance number 1089, which uh, revised some of the specific development standards as such, such as the location and size of the property. Uh, the requirement to not locate on a major secondary highway was removed and the property size requirement was changed from two acres to three acres. As you'll see on the screen, these are the existing site conditions. As you'll see the multi-tenant industrial building, um, there is a small portion that has never been developed on. And then you can also, a little hard to see, but there is the existing cell tower right there. Uh, the request before you tonight, as mentioned, is the tentative parcel map, which is to subdivide the existing 3.46 acre parcel into two parcels, measuring uh, 2.71 acres for parcel one and 0.75 acres for parcel two. And we have DPA 993, which is to construct a new 203,532 gross square foot, three story self storage facility on parcel one. There's DPA's 994 and 995 to construct two multi tenant industrial buildings measuring. 7,368 square feet and 4,764 square feet on parcel two. And last we have, we have CUP 828 to allow for the construction, operation, and maintenance of the new self-storage facility on parcel one. So starting with TPM 83729, we have the existing parcel as mentioned approximately 3.46 acres in size. And the proposal is to subdivide into two parcels, parcel one being 2.71 acres. And parcel two is 0 0.75 acres in size. You can see the uh, new proposed widths of each parcel. And as such, they do meet the state subdivision map act. Uh, now on to DPA 993. Uh, in this slide, you can see the self-storage facility in red. Uh, it has a gross square footage, as mentioned, of 203,532 square feet. Uh, highlighted in red, you can see the, or I'm sorry, highlighted in an orange, you can see the required parking and loading areas. In green, you see the required landscaping. Uh, there that popped up in yellow is the trash enclosure. And then along the property line perimeter, well, there's a proposed eight foot high security fencing. And then there is two six foot high security gates as well. For driveway and circulation, there is a 26 foot wide fire access road, and you can see the proposed parcel line. So there will be a reciprocal access agreement for that shared driveway. Uh, the driveway to the north is 34 feet wide. 
and the driveway to the west is 34 feet, five inches. And here's the floor plan, the first floor. Uh, as you would expect, there is tons of self-storage or uh, locker areas for personal belongings. And there's also a small sales slash uh, rental office area. And then the second and third floor plans are uh, similar. And you can see, oh, it's a little hard to see, but in the south, uh, northwest and northeast corners of the building, you can see these small little areas that are used to uh, display what the self-storage um, will look like. They're just visual, aesthetically um, representations. For the parking and landscaping, the self-storage facility will uh, meet the city's zoning requirements for parking. The required is 21. They will be providing 21 spaces. And then the uh, self-storage facility will be providing more than what is required for the landscaping. Here's the north elevation and the west elevation. The project is a contemporary design with extensive glazing, specifically spandrel glass and storefront glass. Um, they have also provided canopy trimming along the, the, the parapet area. Uh, they use height variations, pop outs between one and three feet, and also a mixture of colors and materials. Here are some more elevations showing the roof uh, deck being at a height of 32 feet, the parapet height of 37.4, and the overall height of 41 feet. And voila, this is what it'll look like once it's done. And now for DPAs 994 and 995. Uh, so as previously mentioned, is two multi-tenant industrial buildings. Building B along the north side is approximately 7,368 7, square feet. And building C, approximately 4,764 square feet. Those are highlighted in red. Uh, we have the landscape highlighted in green. The parking and loading area is highlighted in orange. Again, here is the trash enclosure that will be provided. Again, eight foot high security fence along the property line, and then a six foot high uh, gate security gate for access into the facility. There is also a six foot wide Southern California Edison easement along the easterly property line. And highlighted in blue is the existing monopalm cell tower. This is the floor plan for building B. As you can see, it's multi-tenant. So we have suite A and suite B. And the floor plan for building C, again, suite A and suite B. So for the parking, the uh, multi-tenant facility will provide actually one additional parking stall than what is required by code, and they will also exceed the requirements for landscaping. Here are the elevations for the multi-tenant facility. And similar to the self-storage facility, the applicant is providing a contemporary design with extensive glazing. Uh, spandrel glass, and also garage door glazing, which I'll show you on the next slide. It has a matching canopy trim along the parapet area, height variations, uh, recessed areas for the office areas, and a mixture of colors and materials. So as previously mentioned, uh, these area right here, these are the loading doors and right here, and those are going to be uh, garage door glazing to provide and match the aesthetic of the building. And voila, this is what it will look like once it's complete. Uh, similar to a few recent projects, staff wanted to show you the design review process, um, starting with the preliminary application review to certain revisions and what the final design looks like. Um, you can see the final design shows the um, pop-out depths, the canopy trim, and the applicant made a attempt to mute the orange a little bit with some striping uh, with a complementary color. 
Moving on to CUP 828 for the operational portion of the project. So uh, public storage was established in El Cajon, California in 1972 by founders Wayne Hughes and Ken Valk. Those are the two gentlemen you see off to the right. According to their website, they are the largest owner and operator of self-storage facilities in the world. And they are a publicly traded S&P 500 company with more than 5,000 employees nationwide. It is pursuant to section 155, 213 subsection O that requires these self-storage uses within the M1 zone to obtain a conditional use permit prior to operating. The sales and rental office uh, will be used for inquiries about rental space to pay the rent, purchase packing supplies such as boxes, boxes, packing tape, bubble wrap, shrink wrap, moving blankets, and mattress bags. They will have up to three employees per shift. The facility will be secure, will have secured lobbies and individual access codes, and they will also be climate, it will be in a climate controlled building. These are the hours of operation, Sunday through Saturday at various times. And then I also wanted to mention the plan development overlay. So pursuant to section 155.325, uh, the purpose of the PD zone is essentially to create uh, an, a, a creative approach, add flexibility to the uh, design, design standards to improve it or otherwise provide a high standard of design. And uh, it does mention that uh, the Planning Commission would uh, ensure that those high quality design aspects are um, provided. In addition, there's just additional requirements uh, as such the CUP is required and the Planning Commission has the authority um, to otherwise act on this CUP. So this brings us into a uh, built-in deviation based on that plan development overlay. Uh, as required by section 155.218 of the city's zoning ordinance, the front yard setback is uh, essentially a one-to-one -one ratio. The maximum height of the building is 41 feet and therefore the front yard setback requirement is 41 feet. As provided, the applicant will be providing 39 feet along Imperial Highway and 39 feet, four inches along Marquardt Avenue. But to give you a different perspective, highlighted in red is the um, building mass. Uh, I thought it was gonna show a little better, but highlighted in yellow, you'll see the architectural trim, or otherwise the pop-outs. They range from one foot to three feet. You can see that the distance from the front property line to the building itself meets the front yard setback requirement. It's more than 41 feet. The distance from the front property line to the one foot pop out meets the uh, front yard setback requirement of 41 feet. But it is the uh, three foot pop outs um, that are in. Um, in, intruding into the front yard setback requirement by uh, up to two feet. Should be noted that the uh, areas that are intruding into the front yard setback are simply architectural enhancements and don't add to the overall uh, building floor area. Moving on to the environmental review. Staff has determined that the project is categor categorically exempt pursuant to section 150, 15332. Uh, class 32 in field development, as the proposed project is consistent with the city's general plan and zoning requirements, and the project will not result in any significant uh, traffic noise or air quality or water quality impacts. And there was a categorical exemption report that was attached to the staff report for you. Moving on to the public noticing. I'd like to start with a uh, neighborhood outreach meeting that was held on March 23rd of this year. Um, as suggested by staff, the applicant uh, decided to take a uh, initiative to notice 
all the property owners within 500 feet to give them a well aware uh, effort to comment on the project. Again, that was held in March of this year. Um, there were four attendees, as you see in the sign up sheet, and they were all tenants within the existing building who were simply inquiring about how long their leases were. And then as required for the public hearing, uh, we did notice property owners again within 500 feet and those were mailed out on September 29th. Uh, no in comments or inquiries have been received from that. And then we also published in the Whittier Daily News, same date, and again, no comments were received. For the findings and recommendation, uh, the proposed tentative parcel map meets the criteria set forth in the State Subdivision Map Act. Uh, the project meets the criteria set forth in sections 155, 739, 155, 716, and 155, 330 for granting of a development plan approval, a conditional use permit, and a conditional use permit within the plan development zone. The project involves the construction of three new attractive industrial buildings on a site that is currently underutilized and developed with a structure dating back to the 1950s. The design of the new building provides high quality architecture as demonstrated by glazing, pop-outs, recessed areas, and variations in heights, materials, and colors. And the self-storage building is technically set back minimum 41 feet as required by the zoning code. Again, uh, it is the architectural elements used to enhance the building's appearance that are intruding into the set bar uh, and not used for floor area. As such, it is deemed desirable to ensure compliance with the purposes and intent of the plan development overlay. With that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission find the project categorically exempt pursuant to Class 32 infill development projects, approve TPM 83729, DPA numbers 993 to 995, and CUP 828, subject to the conditions as stated in the attached resolution, and to adopt resolution 216-2022, which incorporates the Planning Commission's uh, findings and actions regarding this matter. That concludes my presentation. I do have the applicant in the audience, and we should have the environmental consultant on the Zoom if there's any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Do any of the commissioners have any questions on this item? Just uh, just one, and um, it sounded like there's gonna be staff members there uh, 24 hours a day. Are there gonna be any live-in uh, tenants or people there? Uh, not to my all knowledge, but I'll let the applicant um, expand on that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, no other questions. I would like to open the public hearing at what's the time 7:13 p.m. I would like to call upon the applicants if they wish to speak or approach the podium or use the raise hand function at this time. Please state your name and city of residence for the record and address the planning commission. Good evening, Chairman Jimenez, members of the Commission, staff and residents, Aaron Anderson representing public storage. So I don't really have anything to add to staff's presentation, so I'll keep my comments brief. Um, but I would like to say thank you for all of their hard work on this project. Um, there were some complexities uh, that especially Mr. Velasco um, helped us work through, and the result of that hard work effectively resulted in two projects, um, one being our storage use and the other being the flex industrial development. So we think this is a win for both public storage and for the city, since we're able to get the storage area that we need and replace some industrial square footage that has been displaced by demolishing the existing building. Vince went through the sales pitch, so I'll skip the public storage <laughs> history lesson. And you know, with that, um, you know, we do agree with the staff report and the conditions of uh, approval as proposed, and we request that the commission vote to approve tonight. Um, then I am here to answer any additional questions, but to address your question, there is no live-in staff here. We don't really follow that model anymore. That's kind of antiquated with the old drive-up buildings. 
And if Vince could do me a favor and maybe dial back to the hours of operation slide that you showed. Yeah. You have a lot of slides. <laughs> okay, so the office hours are the times of the day where it's staffed by a manager. And the access hours are times of the day where customers who have units in the facility can access the gate through either a, a remote or a keypad. So there's no 24 hour on site presence. That being said, we take security very seriously. It's very important for the storage industry. People trust us to keep their things safe. So we have cameras throughout the exterior and interior of the building that are monitored 24 hours a day remotely. And you know, great lighting, unobtrusive lighting, but wall pack lights and site lights to keep the site well lit so people can't hide on the property and do bad things. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from the commissioner or the applicant? Okay. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this matter? Planning sec secretary, is there any comments via email? No, we do not receive any. Okay. Then I would like to close the public hearing at 7.17 p.m. Could I get a motion in a second for item number eight? I'd like to move. I'll move item number eight with staff's recommendations. Moved by Commissioner Rounds. I'll second that. And second by Commissioner Ayala. Planning Secretary, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Rounds? Aye. Chair Jimenez? Aye. Aye. So ordered. Uh, Attorney Katia Furlick, please. The commission's action on this item shall become effective 14 days after receipt by the applicant of written notice of the commission's action. The applicant and or any other interested party may file an appeal of the commission's action to the city council. The appeal must be in writing and filed with the city clerk within the previously mentioned 14 day period. Thank you. Okay. Item number nine, public hearing, CEQA categorical exemption sections 15302, 15303, and 15311. Development plan approval, case number 998, Modification permit, case number 1352-1353. I would like to call upon Assistant Director of Planning, Quan Nugent, to please present item number nine. Evening, uh, Chair Jimenez and members of the Planning Commission. But before I begin my presentation, I believe Trojan Pedro Chacon is here to provide you with a few slides as an introduction. So with that, Great. I will introduce Pedro Cutter-Tacon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pedro Chacon, and I am the senior director, I'm the senior director of manufacturing for the California Operations, and re also responsible for manufacturing engineering of the, our uh, world Trojan battery. So the reason we are here is to present also uh, our company. We've been proudly founded in here in California since 1925. Uh, and our business uh, is basically, we have three factories. These three factories were probably to uh, build uh, uh, batteries, deep cycle batteries for electric vehicles and renewable energy. So since we've been founded in 1925, we also moved to the city of Santa Fe Springs in 1960, which we started in our Anstry factory uh, since the 60s. And we have uh, three uh, chief operations uh, to build components for the second factory that we have here and also in, in Santa Fe Springs, which we call it the Clark Street factory, which we build and assemble these uh, deep cycle batteries that we send worldwide to 120 countries around the world. Um, on the Anstry factory, we 
employ around 120 uh, employees. And for our Clarsfield factory, we are around 350 approximately employees. Uh, we also are in the process of developing a new technology that we actually, we launched a new product, which is the lithium ion that is built in the Clarsfield factory. So with that said, in order for us to continue operating safely and taking care of the um, environment and, and of course our community, which is one of our top priorities in, in our business, we want to replace an existing ICA bathhouse or dust collector with the new state-of-the-art uh, equipment bathhouse. We, it's, it's a brand new wheel liberator. The benefit of this new equipment is, uh, you know, it's benefit residents, workers in the area and the community in general by improving the air quality and overall environmental conditions in the area. Uh, actually, our business is also regulated by uh, SEA QMD Rule 1420.2 that we need to comply in a daily basis, even in a minute basis. Uh, the new backhouse will meet our South California air quality management requirements for the rule that I mentioned. And the plan is to reduce 99% of our, of our uh, lead emissions by, by weight or a lead emissions rate of less than 0 0.003 pounds per hour, which is close to nothing. Uh, Thereby, reducing the amount of lead emissions will benefit our community. Of course, right now we are um, uh, constantly um, uh, achieving those uh, numbers, but the main purpose here is that we have a piece of equipment that is 40 plus years old, and our concern is that that equipment might go down or fail. So with that said, I will uh, pass to Quant, which is going to provide more details on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, so before you uh, is development plan approval case number 998, as well as modification permits case number 1352 and 1353. Try to go over my presentation quickly. I know you're all somewhat tired. <laughs> <laughs> so the property is located on the east side of Ann Street at 9440 Ann Street. It is currently developed with a approximately 41,000 square foot industrial building. The zone is M2 heavy manufacturing and the general plan land use designation is industrial. The applicant is Trojan Battery Company. Just a quick background, um, as Pedro mentioned, Trojan Battery Company operates a battery manufacturing plant on the subject property. Um, battery manufacturing does, however, um, have the potential to generate emissions of lead oxide dust. Therefore, as Pedro mentioned, um, Trojan does, uh, is required to comply with AQMD regulations and air permit conditions. Specifically, uh, they must uh, provide a emission control devices um, in the form of either a HEPA filter or dust collector, in this case, a bag house. Uh, Trojan currently operates three bag houses and many in individual HEPA filters. Uh, unfortunately, the largest of the three bag houses, the, the ICA bag house, is at its, the end of its mechanical efficiency and must therefore be replaced before it stops working. Uh, Trojan's uh, therefore pro proposing to install a new state of the art Willibrator bag house which uh, based on the manufacturer has a guarantee of uh, a 99% removal efficiency. Um, additionally, the wheel abrader bag house will reduce the number of emission points and lead emissions. So as proposed, the project is required to obtain a total of three entitlements, um, development plan approval to give proper attention to the sitting of the new structure, which in this case is the bag house, as well as two modification permits. Uh, first is a modification permit to deviate from the standard parking requirements as set forth in section 155.481. Second is a modification permit related to screening 
um, the standard training requirement uh, for outdoor equipment as, as set forth in section 155.261. First, I'll go over the development plan approval case 998. Um, as proposed, the proposed project uh, related to the DPA 998 is uh, essentially the replacement of the existing industrial clean air, also known as ICA baghouse and air handler with a new state-of-the-art units and the relocation of the existing stormwater treatment to the southerly portion of the property. Uh, down below is essentially an elevation, uh, both front and side of the wheel abrader baghouse unit. This is an existing street view. Um, you can see way in the distance is the existing baghouse um, that is near the end of its term. And just a photo simulation that I tried to create um, showing the proposed wheel abrader bag house. Um, as you can see from the dimensions, it is quite, quite large, um, approximately 60 feet and 70 feet if you go to the top of the cylinder. So as you can imagine, um, it's been a monumental challenge to locate the bag house based on the overall size of the bag house, um, as well as the limited space at the facilities, and also the, the various regulations involved in terms of the building code requirement, the fire code requirement, uh, the zoning code, as well as AQMD requirements. So in addition to that, um, there is also consideration of the applicant's need to continue operating while uh, the, the operating the existing bag house while installation occurs. Um, this is based on an estimated downtime of six months, which equates to an estimated loss of 100 million in revenues. So, you know, just as a little background, staff in Trojan has been working together for approximately one year. Um, just extensively reviewing the project to try to find you know, the best location and the best design. Um, all areas of the facility was reviewed um, based on a review of the north portion. Obviously with the building right up against the property line, there's no space for the bag house. We also reviewed the potential for the bag house to be located on the southerly property line. However, there's an Ez Edison easement that would prohibit any equipment in that location. We also reviewed the westerly portion of the site. This is where the existing parking lot is located. In addition to that, um, placing a bag house in this area, it, it would be highly visible from public view. So probably not the most appropriate location. And lastly, with regards to the east portion of the site, um, this portion is actually close, closer to St. Paul High School than the proposed location. It's important to note that um, AQMD requires toxic modeling and risk assessment for uh, locating bag houses within a thousand feet from a, such a school. There was also consideration and review of the feasibility of placing the bag house on the roof. Um, however, based on the load and the magnitude of the new bag house, um, the, the, the existing roof simply does not have the capacity. So staff essentially also worked together to find appropriate screening method for the bag house. And before we did that, um, you know, there was consideration on its placement. So as you will note, the bag house is located in between the, the air handler unit and the existing bag house. It was strategically placed behind an existing fence in order to allow for additional landscape screen. It was also placed at that location to provide the minimum 1,000 square uh, feet separation from St. Paul High School. Um, so in, in the end, the best location based on the fact that it, it can't be located anywhere else, either the north, the south, the east, the west, 
the, the, the placement was roughly the midpoint um, between the front and the rear property lines, um, between the air handler unit and the existing bag house. Um, to help screen the bag house, just to try to hide it from view, um, staff explored several different approaches. Uh, the first would be basically the vinyl wrap to match the sky and a landscape screen um, to also help screen it from view. While that approach um, did effectively screen the unit, um, it wasn't practical. Um, it was mentioned that you know standard maintenance could damage the wrap and it would thus require frequent repair and replacement. Bless you. Um, secondly, the manufacturer only guaranteed a five year um, for the peeling and fading of the wrap. So, and, and in addition to that, placing new wrap over existing wrap was not recommended because of the height and size of the wrap. Um, it also had to be installed before the equipment was assembled. So it, in order to rewrap the equipment, which would need to occur every five years, uh, one would have to disassemble the equipment, rewrap it, reassemble it, bring it back onto the site, which does, is not practical. So in the end, the most practical approach um, as deemed by staff and Trojan was basically to powder coat the equipment, essentially the, a color to match the building, as well as a landscape screen. Um, the landscape screen would consist of 10 Italian cypress trees along both sides of the driveway in front of the existing fence. It should be noted that Trojan does intend to purchase and install the most mature tree as possible so that there would be um, some screening from the onset. I, I do want to express that staff was concerned with the fact that planting 10 new Italian cypress trees may draw more attention to the site. So we recommended that um, Trojan explored planting additional trees to create landscape theme that would help blend the new trees with the surrounding environment. Trojan did agree to that. Um, they had their architect um, add 10 new trees in a triangular tree well, um, which did not affect existing parking. Um, specifically, there were seven new trees planted along the front property line as well as three along the subway property line. And all trees would be of a similar Italian cypress variety, just a little smaller than the ones that would be screening the equipment. So as proposed um, and mentioned previously, there are two modification permits required. The first is uh, modification 1352, which is to reserve and not provide a total of 21 of the 74 parking spaces on site. Second is modification 1353 to not fully screen the proposed bag house and associated accessories from public view. Just going over my mod modification 1352 related to parking um, as uh, existing, the 45,150 square foot building is required to provide 74 spaces. As proposed, Trojan is uh, proposing to provide 53 spaces thereby requesting a mod to reserve and not provide 21 of the 74 stalls. Here's a site plan showing the 53 spaces. There are 41 standard stalls, two compact stalls, seven parallel stalls, two accessible stalls, and one fan accessible stall. This is an, an alternative plan also known as parking plan B. Uh, Trojan has provided this to show how this the, the site can be striped in the future uh, should the need arise or when Trojan decides to vacate the site. 21 stalls will therefore be reserved and not immediately provided in this sample. So as justification for the parking modification, Trojan has stated that uh, there's a maximum number of uh, 35 total employees required to operate the facility per shift. 
um, with the third with the 53 parking stalls, assuming everyone drives, um, would leave 18 parking stalls or 34 percent available for visitors or any overlap between the shifts. With regards to uh, the modification 1353 related to screening, um, the code currently requires, as stated here in section 155.261, that outdoor storage equipment shall be neat and orderly and also shall be screened on all sides to completely seal such storage use from view from adjacent properties and public streets. Trojan is therefore requesting approval to not fully screen the proposed bag house from public view. Instead, Trojan is requesting to powder coat the equipment a color to match the building, as well as plant 20 trees of Italian cypress variety. Um, as part of the review, staff did um, uh, review the project to be compliant with CEQA, specifically um, deem the project to be categorically exempt um, pursuant to section 15302, 15303, and 15311 uh, based on the fact that the proposed bag house involves a replacement of an existing bag house and air handler unit with new state-of-the-art units. As part of the review, staff also sent out public hearing notices to all properties within 500 feet. Um, the notice was mailed out on September 29th, 2022. To date, no comments have been received. A notice was also published in the Whittier Daily News on September 29th. Also to date, uh, no comments have been received. So for your consideration tonight, um, staff asked that you consider that the, the project does meet the criteria set forth in section 155.739 and 155.697 required for the granting of a DPA and a modification permit respectively. With regards to the development plan approval, uh, staff asked that you consider that Trojan is proactively replacing the old bag house which is near the end of its useful life. Um, we ask that you consider the fact that the new Willibrator bag house will provide 99% removal efficiency. We ask that you consider the new bag house will not only replace the existing ICA, ICA bag house, but also many of the individual HEP, HEPA filters and, and thus significantly reduce emission discharge points. Um, specifically, the baghouse project will effectively reduce 32 existing stacks at the facility down to, to nine. And lastly, uh, we ask that you consider Trojan has carefully selected the placement and design of the baghouse after a comprehensive review of all other alternatives. With regards to the modification permit for parking, um, we ask that you consider that the 53 parking stalls is more than sufficient to accommodate the applicant's needs with 35 employees per shift, 18 stalls remain available for visitors and um, additional um, need based on different shifts. With regards to modification permit uh, related to screening, uh, we ask that you consider that Trojan has thoroughly explored all possible options for locating the screening. Um, and in conclusion, the combination of powder coating and landscaping was found to be the most practical solution. With that said, staff is recommending approval of DPA 998 and modification permit numbers 1352 and 1353. Uh, subject to the conditions of approval as stated in the resolution. Uh, we recommend that you adopt resolution 217-22, which incorporates the commission's finding uh, regarding this matter. And lastly, we ask that you find the project to be categorically exempt from CEQA. 
that concludes my presentation. Um, I do have members of Trojan here available in the audience if you have any questions, as well as myself. Thank you. Thank you, Quan. Do any commissioners have any questions on this item? No. Okay, no questions. I would like to open the public hearing at 7.41 p.m. And I would like to call upon the applicant, if they wish to speak, please approach the podium or use the raise hand function at this time. Okay. No one wishing to speak. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this matter? Planning Commission Secretary, were there any comments submitted via email for item number nine? No, Chair, we did not receive any comments. Okay, then I would like to close the public hearing at 7.42. Could I get a motion and a second on item number nine? Commissioner Carbajal, I move. Commissioner Rounds will second. Motion by Vice Chair Carbajal. Second by Commissioner Rounds. Planning Secretary, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Rounds? Aye. Vice Chair Carbajal? Aye. Chair Humanic? Aye. Passes 4 0. So ordered. Attorney Katia Furlick, please. The Commission's action on this item shall become effective 14 days after receipt by the applicant of written notice of the Commission's action. The applicant and or any other interested party may file in appeal of the commission's action to the city council. The appeal must be in writing and filed with the city clerk within the previously mentioned 14 day period. Thank you. Item number 12, consent agenda items. Consent agenda items are considered routine matters which may be enacted by one motion and roll call vote. Any, any item may be removed from the consent sent agenda and considered separately by the planning commission consent item a conditional use permit case number six seven six zero dash two a compliance review to allow the continued operation and maintenance of an indoor cafe with the drive through lane located at seven nine three zero norwalk boulevard within the c-4 dash pd Community Commercial Planning Development Overlay, Starbucks Coffee Company. Consent Item B, Conditional Use Permit, Case Number 809-2. A compliance review to allow the continued operation and maintenance of a warehouse and distribution use involving oils and lubricants, use totaling 647,600 gallons on property located at 14112 Pont Lavoy Avenue within the M2 heavy manufacturing zone. For consent items number 8A and 8B, is there a motion and a second for approval? Move consent agenda, Commissioner Carbajal. I get a second. Commissioner Ayala, second. Okay, could I get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Rounds? Aye. Vice Chair Carbajal? Aye. Chair Jimenez? Aye. That item passes 4 0. So ordered. Okay, item number 13 announcements. Is there any commissioners that have? and announcements they would like to share. I would just like to say stellar night and excellent staff again on the reports. Loved it. And you're still the best. I'm still your cheerleader. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure Wayne is proud of Jimmy, Vince, and Kwong tonight. They did an excellent job. Excellent. Uh, and a very thorough. Good job, guys. I was trying to wait for them to do that. <laughs> Any comments or no? Okay, none for me. Is there any announcements from staff? Yes, Quan. I have a quick announcement. You, you may have noticed uh, 
two individuals, younger individuals in the audience earlier tonight. I, I blame Vince and Jimmy for their lengthy re re presentations, which chased them off apparently, because they're no longer with us. Yeah. But um, we recently welcomed two, two individuals to the planning fan family. Uh, those two individuals were our interns. Um, this is their first um, introduction to local government. The first intern is Christian Kalasan. Um, He's, he has an associate's degree in architecture from Mount SAC. And he uh, also has a bachelor's degree in planning from Cal Poly Pomona. Um, second intern is Jeffrey Kessler. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in journalism from San Diego State University. And, and he's currently pursuing a master's in planning at UCI. Nice. So they're not here, but please welcome them yes. to the Family. Welcome, interns. Juan, you had promised us after the first two presentations you were going to be brief. You went, <laughs> you went longer. I know. <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay, no. I would like to adjourn the meeting at seven forty-seven. <laughs>